Welcome to another Advanced Manufacturing Media webinar. We're glad you joined us for this segment of Easy CNC with Cinemeric Operate, a three-part series by Siemens Industry Incorporated focusing on the Cinemeric 840D and 828D control. Today's presentation, Commonality of Programming Shop Mill, Program Guide, CAD CAM, and FANUC style ISO programs is the second in the series. The concluding episode, Applying 5 Axis in the Job Shops of Today, will be presented July 22nd. But more about that later. For now, let me introduce myself. I'm Jim Sawyer, the Executive Editor of Manufacturing Engineering Magazine, which is part of SME's Advanced Manufacturing Media. Our sponsor today is Siemens Industry Incorporated, which provides CNCs and motor drive, motors and drives, as well as industrial design and manufacturing software and retrofit services, application engineering, training, and more. This webinar series is intended to provide attendees with an excellent understanding of what it takes to program and run a Cinemeric controlled three-axis mill. During the presentation, you will be able to ask questions using the Q&A box that appears at the right of your screen. Time permitting, your questions will be answered following the presentation. If time runs out before we can get to all of the questions, we will make sure the answers are emailed to you. Portions of this webinar will include screen sharing and videos. As often happens over the Internet, the quality of the presentation can be affected by the type of Internet connection you have, the total bandwidth available to you, and the number of people accessing that bandwidth at the time. Mobile users will not be able to view the screen sharing, but they will be able to hear the audio portion. An archived version of the webinar, viewable no matter what device you are using, including the screen sharing portion, will be available later today. If you experience any audio or visual difficulty during the live presentation, please let us know via the Q&A app. Also, if you have questions about any other aspects of our webinars, please email me at jsawyer at sme.org. The presenter for this webinar is Chris Pollock. Chris started his career as a CNC machinist in the early 90s, having first apprenticed as a Class A machinist and then continuing his apprenticeship in tool and die design and manufacturing. Since 2012, Chris has worked as a machine tool dealer support specialist for Siemens. In that role, Chris supports dealers and importers with Siemens-controlled CNC machines in their inventories. He supports customers in areas such as application training, service training, and sales training. Now, here's Chris Pollack. Thank you, Jim, and hello, everyone. Thank you for attending our Part 2, Easy CNC with Cinemeric Operate. I'm going to be the presenter today, as Jim mentioned. My contact information is here in front of you. For any reason, after the webinar series or in the future, you guys have any questions regarding the Siemens Cinemeric product line, by all means, feel free to reach out to me as a resource. Get me either by phone or probably preferable would be my email address as well, um, which is on the slide in front of you. As Jim mentioned, this is the second of a three-part series. The third part will be coming up August on the 22nd, or shall I say July on the 22nd. And uh, that will be specifically looking at 5-axis technology job shop of today. That, that series will actually go in and start to program 5-axis in a 3 plus 2 type of scenario. You'll get a chance to actually see it uh, simulate and then even animate on a machine tool modeler what the end cutter path would look like handling five-axis shop floor programming. Before we get started on the main content or topic of today, I did want to show you two key websites that you can look at specifically for more information. Websites are here in front of you. 
The main landing page is the usasiemens.com forward slash CNC for you. A main U.S. website page for any CNC Cinemark questions. From there, there is a link to our webinar page where you can also see a series of webinars that we present at Siemens if you're looking for further information on our product. You can either use the link off the CNC for you website or you can this direct website in the front of you. We're going to talk about two main control platforms, 828 control and the 840. Really anything you see here today would apply to either of the two products. Um, some of the functions would be commissioning or OEM specific, whether they wanted to give those features in the controller or not. So as we go through some of the functions, I'll certainly point those out and pick out those features that may be a little more dependent to how a machine manufacturer sets up the control. So today, we're going to look at what we call commonality of programming. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at taking a specific job, a specific part, and methodizing it in ShopMill, which is our conversational programming. For those of us that attended the Part 1 webinar series, um, it's going to be kind of a recap of that programming language or format. Then from there, we're going to look at our program guide system, which is our system for G-code programming. Then we're going to treat it as if the file had been imported from a CAD CAM system. So I've previously posted the same shape job out of uh, master CAM in this case. So we'll get a chance to see how we, we manage and manipulate programs coming in from an external source. And our fourth would be our ISO mode, which is a FANUC compatible mode. So you can actually have program programmed in standard ISO protocol and see how we can run that within the system, edit it, simulate it, do all the functions. While we're playing around with those modes, we'll certainly get a chance to go into auto and run the jobs in each of the corresponding modes or programming sets. So this is an example of the part that we're going to methodize. We're going to come in, we'll profile mill around the part, so we'll get to handle an irregular shape contour or regular shape. Then we're going to go back and we're going to probably center drill or spot drill four holes and then drill four holes. So what we're going to do is the first thing we're going to start to look at when we get into creating these programs is our program manager area. Program manager allows me to go in and physically start creating programs, managing where programs exist, move files back and forth, Maybe I'm managing things that are sitting on a USB or a local drive or a network drive. So that's going to be our primary screen where we're going to be creating and moving programs in and out of the system. From there, we're going to start creating part programs. And as I mentioned earlier, we're going to create a conversational shop mill program as well as a G code program in the program guide format. Once we fire it up, we'll also look at some of the other tools or features that are in the program manager area. For argument's sake, we could take a look at saving tool files. That would give you a backup of your offset table. It saves all of your data, managing some additional features. Possibly, if we have time, we could even look at what we call a multi-clamping function. From there, our first live presentation portion will be creating the shop mill program. When we get into shop mill, you're going to get a chance to see us go into the main programming interface screen, create our what we call our header event, sets up all our modal commands and statements. Then we're going to transition to the event editor and start placing in some cycles. We're going to use our cycle mask or our programming interface that allows us to create functions in a conversational environment. We will use the contour editor to draw this irregular shape. Once we've gone through and created the basics of the program, we get a chance to start to use simulation mode to prove out that specific program, see some of the key features and benefits within simulation mode, such as solid modeling graphics, show path or wireframe portion, our cut functionality to segment up the piece, see some more detail in turn. Then from there, we're going to transition over to auto mode and physically run it. So you get a good understanding of what each of the types of programs are going to look like when an operator is physically in the auto mode and running a job. So 
So with that being said, we're going to transition over to the live portion of our demonstration. Now what I'm launching now is what we call CineTrain. CineTrain is a full machine tool emulator of what you would see on the physical machine tool just running in a PC environment. So the primary screen you see up here in gray, that would be the screen that would represent the machine tool screen. I'm going to be using a series of soft buttons, horizontally and vertically located. See those along the bottom of the screen and on the sides of the screen, as well as the machine control panel, which represents all of your peripheral buttons, your hard buttons. The X, Y, Z buttons select the different features, the jog, the auto, my overrides. I'll slide the print here for a second, the override knob. So that's all representing the machine control panel. So everything I can do physically on the machine I can emulate here in a virtual world. And I'm going to keep the little part print up here in the corner. So as we step through the part program, you can kind of keep an eye on what the original source print looks like, see where I'm getting the numbers from that I'm inputting in. So the first thing we mentioned was we're going to transition over to the program manager area. I get to program manager by using my upper right hand keypad. There's a button on the keypad called program manager. And that's going to launch me to the program manager section. Within Program Manager, along the horizontal soft keys, series of buttons, NC, local drive, USB, secondary local drive buttons. So these are all series of areas that files or programs can exist in. The NC is the standard machine tool memory. So within the NC, as you see it's selected here in blue, I have a series of folders. So I can expand or compress these folders. So within the folders, I have part programs, subprograms, and work pieces. Within there, I can start to create different programs in these different areas. Now, the part program section is reserved to specifically only programs with an MPF extension. That stands for main program file. If I want to create subprogram files, I would need to place them in the subprograms directory. They would have a .spf extension, subprogram file. Or if I want to start creating folders for specific jobs and then grouping all of my different programs, whether they're subprograms or main programs or part program files or prints, that could be actually done down into the workpiece directory. Down in here, you can create folders, and then you can have a whole intermix of file types and folders. Now, some of the additional functions I mentioned earlier can be found if you expand your vertical soft keys over with the double arrow just underneath the cut button. By selecting the double arrow, vertical soft keys change, and now I have a few different features. Archives, preview windows, search, multi-clamping, which is grayed out, properties, my delete key. As you go into different areas or folders, you'll start to see that certain buttons will become active like multi-clamping has become the same thing that became a save setup button. If I was in part programs, I know it's grayed out. Whenever I'm doing a function that's going to create a file other than an MPF or an SPF, I do need to be in a workpiece folder. And that's why the function was grayed out. Something like the save setup tool, what that does is that actually creates an entire backup the machine tool table or tool library whatever offsets or coordinates are set up in the machine, whatever tools are created, I can create a file that's an image of that. And I simply go to Program Manager, expand over my vertical soft keys until I see the Archive button. I want to save setup data. Tell it what I want to do. I'm going to save a complete tool list. Save my magazine location. So I want to save my work offsets. Give it some name. Say OK and the system will automatically create a file it's using the name of whatever folder I was in with an INI extension. That's why it had to be down. Have MPFs in part programs or SPF. So as you start to explore some of these additional functions, if you happen to see the tool is maybe grayed out, it's most likely the directory that you create it in. So what we're going to do is we're going to explore first creating this part program as a review in shop mill. So when in shop mill, I can select any number of these folder areas to program in. I'm going to happen to program in part program. And I'm simply going to go back to my 
base vertical soft key screen and select the New button. New gives me the option of telling it what type of program I'm going to be creating. So in this case, I'm creating a shop metal program. Once I've come in, I give it some name. So I'm going to call mine, we'll call mine example, my first two. Now, when I'm creating file names, letters, numbers, or underscores, no other characters are supported. Um, no dashes, no minus signs or decimal points. If you do try to put them in, it will give you an invalid character. You can't type the wrong thing in. That is why you can't type. So letters, numbers, underscores, we support, I believe, up to 24 characters, but fit quite a, uh, an elaborate file name in play, too. Select OK, and that's going to launch us into shop mill programming. So the first screen I always see when creating a shop mill part program is what we call the header screen. Header screen sets up a bunch of modal commands. For argument's sake, what work offset do I want to use? Or up to 99. That's one of those options that is dependent on how the builder sets up the machine. You can define what the blank's going to look like for our graphics port. So am I machining a cylinder, a pipe, am I doing a basic block where the center of it's zero, zero? Am I defining a block and defining two opposing corners to stipulate the block size? Do multi-sided stock, like text stock. So in this case, if I look down on my part print, I have a zero location, or my dimensional data is being held from my upper left-hand corner. So I'm going to treat that to be my zero, zero location. And then I see the materials over in the X. In this case, a max of four inches would be the finished part length. And it's down in the negative on my Y, three inches. So by going into the basic block function, I can start to describe two opposing corners. Now in this case, I'm leaving an eighth of an inch of material off that top corner. So I have a little bit of material to take for a rough stock cut. I'm also telling it the overall length a little bit bigger than four. So there's some cut on the other side. Same thing with my depth, going down negative 3.12. Then we stipulate the top of the part. If I had some plus material that I was maybe facing off, I could put it now. We're not going to bother putting a facing site. Okay. My overall thickness, certainly the part finishes at a half an inch. So I would have something thicker there. Maybe I knew I wanted to have three quarters of an inch, 50. I retract, where do I want to go when I'm done? This may be cycles. My safety clearance, how close do I want to get to the part before I start machining? Do I want to climb mill or conventional mill? I am down cut, stipulating climb milling, up cut, stipulating conventional mill. Now you'll see on the animated element, we're going to even update it for you. So if there's any question or you're not sure in the terminology, just watch the picture and you should end results path. And then finally, when we're drilling, do we want to do an optimized retract or not? Without it, it would go all the way up to my retract plane, every drill hole that optimized. So you fill out a page. Once you fill out the page, you hit accept, saves the event. Then from there, I start writing the part program. So if I look at this job, let's say for argument's sake, I want to machine around the perimeter of the part first. One of the first things I would do would be go to contour mill, tell it I'm going to create a new contour, give it some names. Call mine my uh, profile, let's say. Name. The name has no bearing on anything, just for your own reference. And now I'm going to, using my display, start to draw my shape. Starting coordinate, I'm going to use x0, y0. There. I give it a, a length or direction or position. So what I did prior to I'm going to pick one of these icons to start describing my shape. So if my first move is going to be over my X positive, I'm going to use a horizontal line. If I wanted to do a Y move, I use a vertical line. If I want to do a two-axis move, I'll use the X. Or if I'm doing an arc, I use the U-shape function. So we pick horizontal line. We tell it the direction or position I'm going to. So in this case, if I look at my print, First straight move goes over two inches, so two 
2-inch value here. Now, after I've defined the 2-inch, if I'm at the intersection of two straight lines, I can blend a radius or a chamfer at the corner. Fortunately, in this case, I'm not. I'm at the start of an arc. So since I'm not at the intersection of two straight lines, I'll have to create this 1.5-inch radius with the arc statement. So I simply hit Accept. See my first line is going to draw on my display. Once the line is drawn, click my Arc command. Now we start describing the arc. We have an arc direction, clockwise or counterclockwise. We have a radius. Radius is 1.5. There's the end point of the arc. If I look at the print, I see it's ending three and a quarter. One in the Y. Now in a scenario like this, there's two potential results. So you'll see in orange the result that you would potentially pick. So I can use the dialog accept button in the upper right hand corner to toggle between. So I want to select smaller of the two arcs. Once that arc is orange, I hit the dialog accept. Accept the arc one last time. And I start to see the arc. So now I'm going to continue drawing the shape with these tools. Uh, my next move is a two axis move, so I pick the X. I'm going to be going all the way over to our four inch, going down in the Y to minus 1.802. Print. Once I get to this location, we're moving down in the Y, all the way down to minus 3. This is a case where I can use our chamfer or our transition to next element function. I'm going to do a chamfer of a half an inch. Now, you never see that draw until I have some other move next. There always has to be something for it to know which direction. I'm moving back to a positive 1 inch in X. You can use the end of corner function if you wanted to do maybe a small corner break. Break my corners with a small now radius. Two axes move now back to zero and back to a minus 1.5. I'll keep doing that little corner break. Now radius. I move up to my final or my starting position in this case because I go all the way around. Zero and I can even end with a corner radius, or if I wanted to as well. And then if you look, maybe a little hard for you to see on the screen, but you'll actually can see that there are small arc blends. So you draw up the shape, hopefully get the desired shape you want. As we were drawing, on the left side, it was creating this little tree. So I can navigate up or down with my blue arrows, get to any element I may want to change. Move over with my blue right arrow, down, my, my chamfer in this case, maybe I want to make it 65, accept it, bigger or smaller. So you'll use this little design tab, modify the shape that you just Once you've created the shape, simply hit accept. That's going to bring me back out to the event editor. So now I see I have a profile created. I now need to tell it what it's doing with that profile. In this case, I'm going to do a path mill, select path mill. A lot of the stuff we went into in much greater detail in the previous webinar. So if you missed it, you may want to go back and take a look. I'm not going to spend time explaining all the features only because we have a lot of content to cover. So in here, I'm just basically stipulating top of the part, depth of the part, depth per pass, if I want to leave material for a finish cut, how do I lead on, how do I lead off, and what do I do between each of my depth passes? Retract, do I maybe keep it down, do a no retract on the bottom? So this is as it swings around before it drops to the next depth. What am I? You fill out the physical cycle, you hit accept, to a link, and now we're starting to write a program. So certainly we can go over to the simulation mode and start to validate the program that we created, or in this case, the cycle we just created. Go in. Simulation should automatically start. Get in a 3D view if I'd like as well. Once I'm into the 3D view, I certainly 
rerun it, and you can see it run that cutter path two D or three dimension. Now, one of the things I did notice is I let off with a straight move. It's actually ramp cutting in. So this is a case where I can start to evaluate a cutter path, maybe make changes in my cycle. So let's say, for argument's sake, I don't want to do a straight move. We'll do a small quarter circle, say a half inch radius. This would re control my lead off on the part. So if I make that quick change, we come into simulate it again. Now see off that change. Looks like for some reason I lost my line speed. Again. Okay. So if you look at it now, just let off. So if I rerun this for you guys, you should see we'll dynamically come around and lead off of the part. You can certainly start to use simulation function start to evaluate and you know adapt the cutter path that you're using, even in a, a cycle level like this with shop mill programming. Once I've milled the part, we do have to drill some holes. So I'm going to come in. I'm going to center drill. Get a center drill out of our tool library. Give it some speeds and speeds. Do I want to compensate for my depth based on the diameter I'm spot drilling to or the tip? So I'm going to use diameter. And I'm going to tell this uh, I'm going to be drilling quarter inch hole through the part. So maybe I know I want to do a 3 8 chamfer. So I'm going to put a 375 diameter. Do I want to dwell at the bottom of each hole? No, I do not. So I'm going to set it to zero. And I accept it. Now, the beauty within Siemens is I have the ability, if I'm doing multiple operations on a set of holes, set up all of my can cycles prior to my position. Here I can go in, pick my drill. I happen to have one created for us, quarter drill. Fill out the page. Deep do I want to drill it, whatnot. Accept it. And see how they start to link a little bracket on the end that chain them all together. So my final move in this case, would final event, would be the location. This would be telling it where it's going to. So I'm just going to use the random positions. And then in here, you define your different drilled locations. First position was 5 eighths over, 5 eighths down. I then moved over to 2.125 have a nothing in the Y because I'm not moving the Y. I certainly could still duplicate the negative 625 or 5 eighths. Fine. Then I come over to 1.5 and down to 275. Then I finish coming over to 3 inch. So you fill out the page, you accept it. Now when I simulate it, see holes. So we profile. Center drill. So our. Now I notice I didn't make it all the way through. If I was to look at the bottom, I have holes through the part. That's a carrier where I can start to cycle, adapt. So in this case, I can open up my drilling cycle, maybe change my strategy for drill depth from tip to shank, give it the total thickness of the part system will automatically then take the tool. One of the fields in the tool table that it has is the tip angle of the drill. So now it will know how deep to drill because it's going to go three quarters of an inch plus you have to take tip angle. So here we see we're looking at it from the bottom. Center drill, 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 and now we have four holes. So once you've proved out the program, when it's time to run, we leave your Highlight on the first line of the part program. Go over to Execute. Cycle Start. Now we see the machine start to run the part. This would be the traditional method you would see when, when running in shop mill programs. You have a basic blocks function you can turn on. If you want to see each move that the system is about to do. Well, with that, turn on a real-time simulator, or what we call a simultaneous board function graphics on the screen. This is all live. So if an operator puts the speed rate to zero, the tool stops, 
cranks the feed rate up. Okay. So what we're going to do now is we're going to go back to our presentation. We're going to start to take a look at now comparing with our commonality function how I would methodize that part if I was going to do it in G code. And G code through what we call our program guide mode. So program guide is a G code interface, but it's really G code and kind of conversational intermixed. So we have what we call cycle support for any of our heavy can cycles. So you can actually go in and we'll see when it's time for me to write a can cycle, I don't have to memorize all of the different indicators for you know XYZ, IJK to define what the cycle is going to do, I just open up the cycle mask, fill it out conversationally, will then save it in a G code format for me. We also have functions like the contour editor you just saw. So we're going to get a chance to go in and it's a slightly different mechanism when doing it. So you're going to get to see the difference in functionality when using that. Once we've created the part, simulate it real quick, showing you the, that you're using the same exact tools, either mode. Well, we'll also get a chance to go and run it, and you'll see it'll look a little different because it's the same screen, same functions, same ability within. So if we transition back to new train, we can start to create program guide G code program. So what I'm going to do, just like we started with, I'm going to go back to program manager. I'm going to pick the folder that I want to write the program in. In this case, it's going to be our program folder. I'm going to select new, but now instead of selecting the shop mill function, I want to make sure I select guide. In program guide, I can now tell it the name of the file. So I'm going to pull two, select OK, and now it launches me in the editor. Notice no header page comes up. There would not be any header type page in a G-code program. So it's now up to me to start writing the typical safe start type commands that I would usually have in a G-code program. So in this case, I'm going to start with a G17. G17 for the normal tool orientation. That means the tool's pointing down in the Z. I'm going to do a G90 for absolute programming. I'm going to do a G700, simulating inch mode with inch and I'm going to do a G54, simulating the work coordinate I will be using in our program. Once I've defined initial setter line, probably the next step would be to get a tool in the middle. So I'm going to use under the editor edit function, there in the upper right hand corner there's a function called select tool. And what select tool does is it allows me to pick the tool off of the library. Now certainly one of the unique things with fact that we can name our tools. Inch and a quarter end mill, I can call it inch and a quarter. The way that works in G code, however, is it's going to stipulate a T equals within quotations name of the tool. That's the name of the tool as it exists in the offset table. So if we look back at offset, we see a one space quarter space end mill. The way that reads here, the exact way it must read before Quotation. So to keep me from having to type out that name every time and potentially make a typo, I can just use the select tool mechanism and the system will automatically. So once we've given it tool, change, then I may want to tell it uh, what's my feed rate type. Kind of minute, inches per rev. So I'm going to be in inches per minute, G94. What feed rate do I want to run? Maybe we'll run 50 inches per minute. I'm probably going to want to fire up my spindle here, so let's give it some spindle RPM, give it a spindle direction. Maybe at this point I want to turn my coolant on. Um, coolant could have been on the same line as my M3. We can we allow up to, I believe it's seven M codes per line, if you like or need to. So, you know, a lot of times I'll do my M5 and my M9 all in the same second. Once I've fired it up, fired up my spindle. Now I could maybe pre-position my tool if I wanted to, not necessarily uh, in this case because I'm going to be going into a cycle, but if I wanted to, I could do maybe a rapid to X0, Y0, the quarter inch above the part. So now when it comes to creating cycles, 
specifically profiles or contours like we just did, I'm going to still go into the contour mill. You'll notice that the, the screen and the functions look the same, you have the option, but the difference is the structure. So what happens in creating contours in G-code is the contour shape, when I go and create the new contour, actually is placed at the end of the program, after an M30. And I use this call contour button to tell it when I'm ready to actually call up that contour. So generally what I will do here is I will give myself a little bit of room and type my end of program, my M30. Now I can start creating my contours after my M30. So I go over to Contour, go to New Contour, give it some name. I oh, I wanted to call it. I say Accept. It launches the exact same contour feed that you just saw. Work identically to it. Now, as a little trick, I'm going to not recreate the entire contour, but to save time, I can actually open up the program I just did. One, and I can steal or copy contour from there, paste it, program. So this would be the way it would have looked if I had gone through all the steps. It draws the same, like you saw earlier. Go through each of the lines, creating the shape. But what it does, once I save it, is after my M30, you see my M30 right here. After the M30, this will be the way a contour looks in general. So if you want to edit it, just make sure you're down somewhere in this area. Hit the blue arrow over the editor. But when it's time to use it, our program, now going to go to Contour Mill, go to my Contour button again, go to my Call Contour, type in the name, and the name does have to match whatever name I previously used, so I call pr Profile. If I get the name wrong, it's just not Contour. And you can see that's the Contour name is right here to the right of that A. It says Profile. That's the name. So once I've used the Cycle 62, the profile is now staged. From there, I can go back, Path Mill, Cycle's almost identical to what you a couple different things, you know, you don't do tool changes here, you don't fire up the spindle because it's G code, so it's understood that that was potentially done prior to it. Other than that, pretty much the same stuff, you know, am I roughing, am I finishing, forward and reverse, do I want to follow the direction I drew the shape or not? So I fill out the page, hit accept, but now you see it comes in as a cycle. This is the, the beauty of C. I don't need to know all of these little indicators. Use the hand cycles, edit them, and support them. It's fully conversational. And as we see when we get to CAM, even stuff that's being posted from a key, edit it conversationally, right? So I now really have enough to start to simulate. So if I start to simulate the part program, similar cutter path as I saw before. Now, in this case, you see how I'm just seeing the show path, because I happen to have the show path function on, but I have no blank. That's no so when you hit the double arrow over in G-code, if there's no blank defined in the part, you can turn on the blank by coming into this screen, filling out this blank. So here I could tell it the same values I really put in that header page on the first example. Five. Again, just a duplication of what I had before. So now it gives me a blank. I can rerun it. I can see the graphics on the screen. Certainly the downfall here, though, is every time I transition back in, i got to remember to hit my double arrow, go into blank, and accept it. We'll retain these values, but I do have to hit accept after each. What I can also do, if I wanted to, right up at the beginning, go to various, go to our blank function, and I can insert this in as a cycle, just like So once the work piece is defined, and usually I like to put this just after my work coordinate, after what I'm finding which work coordinate I'm using, 
then as I simulate, it will automatically pre-draw the blank shape for me. Here we come in, profiles around, off and running. Next step would be to change in tools. So when I get to doing tool changes here in G-Code, I want to go back to my editor button. I move back so I can select tool function. Now I can pick up a center drill, put the center drill in. Uh, maybe I'm going to leave my feeder it from before, but we'll do a slightly different one. And let's say, spindle back on, pull it on. Now, even with something like a center drill, as long as I'm in inches per minute mode, which as long as I've pre-selected the profile, which I have, I can even use functions half mil tampering. So here, within the system, I can come in, I can tell it a chamfer size. Maybe I want to put a 50,000 chamfer on my part. Tell it that. Yeah. So this is stipulating the size of the chamfer I'm about to machine. Then I'm stipulating how far down the cutter is going to go, going 100,000, just so I'm going to the tip line right up with the edge. Roll a burr. Now I can start to even do chamfers so quickly by using leaving the preparatory cycle call already there. If I had called up a different cycle in between them, that cycle call statement again, reload it in the system. See, adding a chamfer to. We can also go in and now start to drill some holes. So when I go to drilling and I go to centering, again, show me the data mask, what I want to do. So I'm going to do a spot drill, a 375. Now, when you get to drilling, the mechanism is a little different. There's no grouping of events. You use this M call statement. So when I was in here, I have an option for a single hole or multiple holes. Multiple holes use M call, modal call, meaning it's stay on until I tell it something else. So when I call when I save it with the M call statement, that's why I get this M call before the cycle eighty one. Now drilling's on modally. Now I can just give it a bunch of rapid moves if I wanted to and it would a center drill at those locations. I do have a position screen like you saw earlier. Now one trick is we have a label here since I'm not grouping in, I can't group, you tend to have a little bit more data between operations. So I'm just going to call this holes, accept it, final M call. Now we just spot drilled some holes. I'm going to go in and do, take, put my final drill in. Let's go grab quarter inch drill. Maybe I want to be in a feed perev mode, G95, maybe 5 dot perev. I can certainly drill that way as well. Fire up my spindle. Pull and on, especially for tool changes, maybe. Cutting that off. Go back to drilling. Pick the drilling cycle I want to do. 750 down. M call still on. Now I can certainly have came up and maybe copied and pasted this event. Edit is simply mark to highlight multiples or just copy and paste. Or since I named the cycle with holes, I can use under drilling, under positions, I have a position repeat function. And that lets me go look back for a label that I just previously created called holes, keeping me from having to again duplicate those hole positions another time. Hey, look back. Did you see the old holes? If you did, go do those. So I always want to shut it off with an M call. Now, typically, when I'm ending a program, I'm probably going to stop my spindle, stop my coolant. We can use what's called a SUPA statement. SUPA is a suppression of the active work coordinate system. I'm going to use a D0 to cancel all active tools. Now, SUPA is a non-modal statement. Only suppressing the work coordinate system for this line, but the D0 is modal. So if I cancel a tool offset, I do have to reload it either by stating the tool 
again, or using a D1 statement or a D with a number. I'm going to move up my zero. Here, I'm going to maybe do one final supa. Stage RX. Maybe I know this is a 60 inch travel machine. All travel is negative. So the value I'm giving it now, X and Y, these are not relative to the work coordinate system, relative to the wherever your machine home position is. Same thing with set of work offset, the number that gets applied into the offset, distance from zero or machine home. If I simulate, start to see. Syntax error. Of course I do. Look. Yeah. Helps for me to put an F. Beauty of simulation. Okay. So we come back in. Simulation here. Profile, as you saw earlier. Chamfer. I mean, holes. Holes. Daylight. So once you've proofed out, you'll notice the program itself, the cycles are intentionally almost identical. So if you learn them in one area, you can apply them to the other. And then really the mechanism is more historic of a traditional G code program. So it flows very similar programmed uh, in any in any control. Now once you've programmed out the G code program, I can hit the execute button go over to my auto mode. This will place in auto. Now you'll notice, instead of seeing the one like sign, uh, cycle line, now you see each of the moves. So if I was to press cycle start right now, running the part program, we do still have simultaneous record. So all the same functions used or no inside of auto mode still exist. Now, of course, you see that line there, that was because I left the pool down, so I ran it, cut her in that position. If I rerun it again, coming from a safe area, I won't get a line right through this. But here you can see we're machining around, machining this. I can go into a single block mode now if I wanted to. Oh, my overrides. Everything is running. It would real time. Okay. So now what we're going to do is I do want to get over to looking at the CAD CAM version or side of it. So if I move back to the presentation, the next area we look at is how do we manage, how do we run the same types of files if, I, if they were derived from a CAD CAM system. Here, we're going to get an option to open up the CAD CAM file. We'll actually import it as if we were importing it from an external source. We'll look at the cycle support. So Posted externally, still editing it. Conversation. We'll be able to maybe add events like the workpiece function so earlier to that program. We can go and we can simulate it, finding some operations. We'll go and we'll potentially run it so you can see what the difference looks like. You know, when I'm running inside of the regular program, but I'd use in the CAM cycles more you know, internally into that CAN cycle. Here, when we run it on an external, we're just going to have every single line and, and arc move in the program. So by transitioning back to now start to take a look. Okay, so we're in the live demonstration portion. So if I go back over to Program Manager, the thing kind of starts from, I can use the local drive function. I want to bring in from an X. So select local drive. In this case, it's a folder mapped on my hard drive. This would look the same as if it was a network drive. It would just say network. The labeling. In my case, a folder here. 
stuff in ours. Yes. There we are. And I have what I call my original cake and file cook, unedited file. So if I copy this file, place it in my part program memory. Now, if I open it up, this would be how a straight posted file coming out of somebody like Case Master would look like. So you notice that instead of running base camp cycle for mill, they're just going to give you all of the moves that the system, all the lines, arcs, potential graph putting arc. But when you get down to the bottom and I get into the drilling, you know, I will change, I have my drill. When you get to the can cycles, the system recognizes that it is a can cycle. So by simply hitting the blue arrow to the right, I can still open it and edit it spatially. The beauty of that, as I go into the different system, if I need to do any editing or updates out of the machine tool, it makes it a lot easier. A lot more confidence here. See what's going on as I flip through the different parameters. It tells me what I'm about to fill in. It has full help screens by the cycle that I'm in. So just by simply hitting the help button, I can stuff up. So in this case, we're going to out of the cycle. Now, if I was to simulate it now as she stands, it looked just like that first time I ran the other program guide program. I don't have any blank. Very rarely do you see CAM systems output the blank. They can. It's very possible we have had posts incorporated in it. But if it's not there, it's not the end of the world. I can use the blank back on like I did and then run the system. Like a little bit here, or we can even add blank into the part program. So in this case, I can jump back to the part program. Now you mentioned earlier, you might remember earlier, I do like to position the blank somewhere after my work coordinate call. Look at the source code here, work coordinate here. I put it so we can there. Go back to various. Blank hit accept. Now if I simulate it, tool change. Our block comes up. Round. Now I have the full. So even if you're running things in CAD CAM, certainly start to take advantage of all of these key functions. Now, some of the real powerful things come into, you know, intermixing um, CAD CAM and conversational or G-code programs, creating sub-programs. You know, hey, uh, let's save in this job. I obviously didn't get my center drilled holes. So what if I want to add those features? So I can go back, figure out a spot where I would want to place that, and call it up as a sub-program. So here in this program, after my M01, see that I have the tool change. So really, prior to this drill call would be where I would want to center drill. So what I did here, previously created a quick little cycle called spot drill. Spot drill, I just did it as a G-code file, and it's really just, hey, load the tool, fire up the spindle, where am I center drilling, shut it back off, maybe add to some so if I want to call up a file or a program from another program, it's as simple as literally just typing the name. So if I'm inside CAM original, go down to that 01, right here, and I simply type in spot drill. Now, I do want to make sure that I get it exact. If I have a typo here, I pull the file up. But now as I simulate, system comes down, hits the spot drill section, it'll automatically apply a center drilling routine. So even if we're doing a lot of the programming for this through a CAD CAM pack, this is very common, it still benefits you to learn functions within the I can add routines really. I could, you know, hey, the programming department forgot to center drill these holes or didn't think they needed to based on the tooling you were using. Now you're finding the drills walking. You can start to incorporate and add features really quickly. Um, and even something like, you know, 
what if I want to do the intermix conversational because I'm not that G-code savvy. I could have done the same thing with a So here, let's say I take example one, copy it, and paste it. And I'm going to call this font fill 2. Now, I just made it from the program we wrote earlier. However, there's a couple changes to make this subroutine. First of all, I don't want to tell it a work coordinate or a blank. Those are going to be set up in the main program. I don't need, so I'm going to use my mark command and highlight a couple. don't need my milling. Cut that out. Drilling, I'm going to cut that out. So basically, I have a quick little header. I have my tool call with my can cycle. I have my position location. So now, back in my CAM program, run on down, calling up the other one, simply change my spot drill to the new name. Now we go to simulate it, and you'll see we're getting the same center drill repo routine, but I'm calling a conversational file from Made it real quick, so warning me that I wrote it in Scott Mill, but never tested it. That's it. You ever get that armor warning? You just want to simulate it first. Normally, I would have simulated validate the program. So here I simulate it there. Back into the program. Now we simulate ours. Center drill routine from a file. Okay. So I know we're, we're running a little long on time. Um, what I do want to do is I, I want to give you guys an opportunity just to see the ISO mode real quick. So I am going to transition over to uh, an ISO-based program. So if I go over to the Program Manager section, happen to have one pre-created. So if I open up that file, simulate it, show you the simulation first, you surprisingly simple seeing. Oh no, this had a couple little straight ramp on spot drill and drilling some now if you look at the base program however, you'll notice that a lot of the commands look very different. And the first thing to see here is this G291. This is what triggers ISO mode. Now, your machine has to be set up for ISO initially. If it's not, mode's not going to work. G291 is going to give you an unrecognized. How do I know am my machine set up for ISO program? Well, the simplest way is go to your offset table. And if the machine was commissioned for ISO, you're going to get a column just to the right of the D column. It's called H. H is your offset call. ISO or FANUC style programming, they call up the tool with a G43H command. So I need to have an H column to link to the H command. So as long as the H column is there, your machine is currently commissioned for ISO mode. If the H is not there, the machine could be reconfigured for it, but I would strongly suggest talking directly to the OEM and see if they support this mode. Now, one of the big things you'll, you'll notice is I already have a couple tools pre-created with simple numbers. When running in ISO mode, ISO programs or ISO controls don't support our naming nomenclature. Control platforms, numbers, and only use numbers. That's okay. If you want to use a number, whether in R mode or ISO mode, you just tell it the number, as, the name as a number. So if I looked at the program, down here, M6T1. T1 will automatically look for whatever tool is named. Could I have typed T equals quotations, the number one? In R mode, yeah, would still work, but you wouldn't have to write the T1. In here, you can't use the quotations in the e in ISO. So but other than that, you'll see the G28, your reference returns, very common. Um, G20, that's a big difference between there's an R, and I was looking at that. But G20 right here, that's inch mode in ISO, um, where, where G70 or G700. 
slightly different command. So see, this is a direct drop-in. Really no editing needed aside from putting the G91. We don't like to see the program name, the O, and the four-digit number, so you get rid of that. And if you happen to have an older post where it's posting percent sign, remove the percent sign. Other than that, I mean, using standard drilling cycles like a G81, right here, standard G81 cycle. Now, if I want my simulation or my graphics, I still do have the option of back to that blank function. So if you let it simulate once, edit the blank. So now you can, newer versions of our control, start to intermix some of our cycles. So in this case, you see I had added the workpiece blank. Naturally, that normally wouldn't be there. Then it would have looked like it's in four. So the final thing would be, what would this program look like in an auto mode? Like just like it looks in the editor. So as I'm running the part program, line as it goes, your distance to go, single block, stop at the end of each move, step it through. You have the sign with graphics here. It's an ISO mode. Now if you go to, and I'm going to go a second, if I go to all of our G code function, and I'm in the midst of running, I'll start to show you in ISO mode, so you'll notice even the modal G code look different running in ISO compatible mode. We try to get everything to adjust. See, normally it looks like this. A lot of verbal statements, a lot of advanced commands, ISO based control. When you're running in ISO mode, I'll show you just the ISO command play here. Okay. So we're gonna transition back to the end of our webinar section. I am going to uh, give it back to Jim and open up the floor for some potential questions. Hi, this is Jim Sawyer again, and thank you, Chris. That was a, a rather detailed uh, explanation there, and I'm sure that uh, our attendees found that uh, quite informative. Uh, and uh, we can tell that by the, uh, the questions that they have asked here. Um, Number one on the list, um, how would you pass a variable from the main program to a sub-program? Um, what I can do, I can set variables, and actually if I take control here again, I'll show you a little bit. Um, we have a system called R variables in the control. R variables are user variables. They can be found back in the offset table under user variables. So initially what happens is any variable that's typed in here, if I just call up this variable from a program, by literally typing R0 or R1, when it's, the system will automatically look at this section. So let's say for argument's sake, uh, in my program, we'll go into example two, inside of a cycle, and I want my feed to be a variable. So I could say, hey, use R0 here, so what happens is when, it, when it's running and it goes into the cycle, it's going to look to this table. Now, however, if I, in the program, beginning, usually towards the top, set that variable, so say I say R0 equals 100, as you run this program, it's going to write to that table. So since I'm writing to the table, if I then let the subprogram look for R0, it's going to grab it off this table, which was just written from the main. So really just by using that set statement or set command of establishing an R, R variable to a number, I can then call up those R variables. I just got to make sure that the subprogram gets called after I've defined the variable. That makes sense. Yes, it does. That's uh that's really rather clever. Yeah, it's pretty cool, isn't it? You can do all kinds of crazy stuff. You can interact yeah. our variables right inside of conversational programs. And do some pretty cool. Cool. Um, here's another one. Will a copy of the original CAM program be available? 
Um, I think they mean for giving out after the the webinar. You think that's what they're for? I'm I'm not sure exactly what they mean. It's uh, well, uh, if it's a case where they'd like to see it, um, I did post my email at the beginning. Just shoot me an email. I'd be happy to share it. Okay. Everybody, we don't have a mechanism that I know of to be able to share uh, specific information off of these webinars. Correct. Somewhere that if somebody um, goes out or something. We we can uh, we can do a back and forth and interactive. Uh, uh, oh, here it is. Uh, the attendee is still here. We wanted to inspect the CNC program. Is, That's probably is, the best bet. Um, and let me push back uh, my contact information. I would say if they just email me directly, it might be a lot easier to leverage the whole mechanism. So if you just uh, shoot me an email at chris.pollock at siemens.com, uh, reminding me, I would be happy to share with you that as well as I have a lot of other additional information to create a post. Pretty common. Okay, one. very good. Now here's another one. When it comes to five axis programming and machining, can I use ISO mode? So that's that's a little bit of a sticky scenario. Um, in theory you could. However, I would strongly recommend against <clears> it. There's a lot of advanced functions that really make the CPU fine, especially in a those would not be supported because they really don't exist in that ISO mode and competitive controls. So I would recommend against it. I would really just use leverage ISO if I'm doing three axis milling, two axis turn. All right. Um, is it possible for my CAM system to output the block form information? The work piece. Um, yes, yes it is. Um, certainly will depend on the CAM system you're using. Um, I know MasterCAM can do it. They can create the site from, uh, from specifically from their blank. So it would be something to, to talk to whoever your post writer is, but absolutely it's, uh, there's not a lot of triggers there for them to be able to write. All right, now we have run over by a bit, so we'll uh, we'll take just one more here. Um, when I use the FANUC compatible mode for turning, is there any way to select the protocol of G code the system uh, is reading? Yes, and what the the uh, question is referring to, or the attendee is is asking about, is a lot of people don't realize. When you look, when you program in FANUC, there's actually three different protocols of what G-code they support. They call it A, B, and C. So it has to do with you know which G-code is used for a multi-line threading cycle, what uh, what G-code defines constant surface speed. A whole list of um, G-code states changed over the years in turning, and that's referred to by a A, B, or C protocol. So the big trick here is you need to know which you want to comply with, A, B, or C. And if you look in any standard FANUC manual, it'll show you the three column types. So you just got to figure out what you're using for commands and what group they're in. And then on our side, there's a couple parameters you just adjust in the back end to comply with any one of those protocols. All right. Um, we have gone over, as I said, um, and any unanswered questions, we will uh, we will send out emails with answers. Um, as we learned from Chris, CNC machines and machine controls can be quite complex, but they don't need to be intimidating. They are, however, a key component of manufacturing today. And that brings us to part three of this series. It will be presented at 2.05 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time on July 22nd, and it will cover applying five axes in the job shops of today. You may register for this concluding chapter in the series at www.tinyurl.com slash Siemens hyphen webinar hyphen three, or there is a link in the box below the uh, Q&A box on your, the right side of your screen. You can click there and register for uh, for that webinar. 
So uh, thank you very much. Uh, SME and manufacturing engineering do have a host of ways to keep in touch with the latest developments in manufacturing. And uh, for instance, uh, the July issue of Manufacturing Engineering explains the how and why, uh, how and why complex parts machining with five-axis machines is growing more popular. And our August issue takes a look at handheld measurement and inspection. For uh, SME events, we do have some upcoming shows. West Tech, which will be held in mid-September in Los Angeles and uh, the Canadian Manufacturing Technology Show, which begins September 28th and continues through October 1st in Mississauga, Ontario. Thanks for joining us for this Advanced Manufacturing Media Webinar. We hope you found it informative.